Thank you for joining me today on the Who God Says podcast. I am your host and Kingdom Ambassador, Ty Chandra. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> today we have a special guest. Oh my God. She is a dynamic, innovative entrepreneur. She's an international speaker, the founder and president of Titan Management, Miss Catherine McCord. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And I'm actually, this is a special episode because tomorrow is the birthday of my company. And oh. so we're going to be 10 years old. <laughs> Happy anniversary. Happy birthday. I'm so excited. Oh I'm so proud. I am. It's been quite a journey. So this is this That's is a big I'm accomplishment. Doing. I'm proud of you. Yay. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Oh, my God. Is there going to be cake? Of course. I look for any oh excuse God. to have cake. Like any I excuse need ever. So yes, there will definitely be cake. <laughs> I need cake. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm starting on my fitness journey, so I'm like cake deprived. So you know I firmly believe that everything in small doses is good, right? Well almost everything in small yeah. doses is good, right? So a little bit of cake. Even a friend of mine who is a health coach, she's mm -hmm. incredible. And one of the things that she teaches is that you can have the things you love in moderation mm -hmm. and not every mm -hmm. day, <laughs> you know, so you can and that's that what I'm working on. Just period. That's what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm maybe not all it. the cake. Like I have a habit of eating way too much cake. So we just have to cut down the amounts, you know, make it more. Yeah, see, that's what, that's what I'm working on. Yeah. Not all the cheesecake, not all. Oh my God. The Strawberry shortcake. Okay, let's go on to show. <laughs> next topic. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I started getting flashes of just cakes just sitting. Okay. Oh, so. My favorite, my favorite, I, like Italian cream, like a Ooh. really good carrot cake will kind of get me right. Okay. Um, and I loved it because for my sister's wedding, she let me pick the wedding cake. And we ended up with three tiers of different kinds of cake with different fillings in them. And it was incredible. <laughs> you know what? Mm. Give me the strength to you. <laughs> yeah. My, said, my daughter has a box of zebra cakes yesterday. And she was like, Mom, can I have one? I told her to get one. And I was sitting there like, oh, my God. I want nope. <laughs> Don't do it. Give me strength. Give me strength. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh my God. Okay. So we're, we're going to start the show. Um, can you tell us where you grew up and like what's your spiritual background? Yeah. If you had that in your household. Sure, sure, sure. So I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and I eventually mm -hmm. lived all over Texas, but I grew up in Dallas, spent most of my childhood there, and then eventually ended up back there for quite some time. And I'm determined to go back and die there at some point, even though I live in South Florida oh. now. And um, I, I have a very interesting background because my grandparents on one side were missionaries uh, in mm -hmm. Papua New Guinea. And then I have music ministers on the other side, like plural music ministers okay. on the other side, my okay. father included. And so I grew up very much in the church, all different denominations around me. Um, and I also interestingly my family was also very big in educating on other religions and as i got mm. older i started learning a whole lot about other religions so now i have this like yay jesus approach with like some of the cool traditions and mentalities from other faiths that i that i just found mm. aligned beautifully because a lot of those things actually do align very beautifully and a lot of people don't know that jesus is actually part of other religions too and so you can you can kind of bring some of the cool elements uh, from all of those things into one uh, and and go that way. So that's where I am now. But I very much grew up in the church. Still love to go hear my daddy play and and direct the music and and all that kind of fun stuff. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I'm glad that you grew up in the church. Um, what is your perspective from growing up? in the church like having that background from both sides um how was it when you like got into the world like when you got into hey i'm a young lady now how did you kind of connect spiritually with let me find my way through 
So I was also raised to be very curious and to ask mm -hmm. lots of questions. In fact, I used to get kicked out of Sunday school because I asked too many questions and I asked questions that they were not prepared to answer from such a small child. <laughs> and <laughs> like one day, this is a true story. I was about six years old when this happened and they, the Sunday school teacher brought me to my mother and said, I'm so sorry, Miss McCord, but you're going to have to keep her with you. She won't quit asking this question. And she goes, what is it? And she goes, They're, she, they said, she's really upset because God made a virgin give birth and she's not dropping it. And like, she's really upset about this and wants to ask questions about it. And these other kids don't know what she's talking about. And so like, <laughs> like this is this. And so, <laughs> so I was always curious and I always had my questions answered. We have very theological discussions in my family and uh, either led by my grandfather who just turned 90 uh, the other day um, and is still with us. God bless him. Um, and whether it was my father, my mother, they did, we, it was this common thing to, to have deep discussions to this day. We'll still sit around and debate things and talk about things. And so I was very prepared to have questions asked and to ask further questions. That was okay. normal to me. And okay. I was always intrigued as a child by other people's faith. And like we would go participate in Passover and I would go, um, you know, be with friends of mine who were Muslim when they prayed and, and watch, you know, be part of that because I wanted to understand, I wanted to learn. And yeah. uh, so getting out there in the world was just a whole lot more of that. And now I get to be uh, even more, you know, annoying and, and get on, or actually less annoying and get on Google and do it instead of just bugging people to death, asking them 50,000 questions. Um, <laughs> now I can just get on Google and, and do a lot of the research myself. But it, it, it fit in beautifully because I believe that God calls us to be curious about the world around us and to, yeah. and to ask others and to be loving and accepting of other people and to love them no matter what. So to me, it was the most natural yeah. thing in the world to just get out there and mingle with other people and share each other's experiences. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And I know a lot of people think the first thing that we should do is judge because they don't, other people don't quite line up with what our beliefs are and what God says um, we should be. But the judgment is for God. It's not for us. We can't take his place. We cannot take his seat. Um, he, Jesus gave us two commandments to sum it all up. Yeah. Love God above all else and love your neighbor as yourself. So how can you do that if you're putting your neighbor down? That's right. Would you want them to do that to you? So, yeah, I agree. We are here to love and serve. And that's it. And that's it. That's all there is to it. I don't. And, you know, I, I like to use the examples with people of how Jesus worked with other people and how he communicated with them and how he even would welcome yeah. them into his fold when they were not as far along in their journey as he was. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I use you know, some of the specific stories, but I think it's so very important to remember that that's the whole purpose. That's it. Like you said, that's his love. That's, that's beginning, middle and end of, of everything. And so when we bring everything back to that, kind mm -hmm. of the common missions. And even in my professional work, I talk a lot about the common mission, find your common yeah. mission. And then it yes. all just comes together. And nothing infuriates me more than somebody in the name of Jesus spreading hate. And I'm like, oh, you missed, I don't know what Bible you read, but we right. can get you a different one because that's not the right one. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's not it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Oh, my God. Ooh, you know what? We'll stay on that subject all day long. All day. I can get on a very big soapbox about that one. Because, <laughs> ooh, 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 you know, but I don't like to, um, I don't like to, to seem like I'm using any platform that God has given me to finger point or condemn or anything. Right. So I try to stay away from it, but there's a lot. <laughs> there's, there's a lot 
Um, I'm not here to make a point. I'm not here to condemn anyone. There is no condemnation in child of God. So I'm not here to condemn. I'm not here to finger point. Um, I've always said life is about choices. You have choices. God even gives you a choice. So choose ye this day who you will serve. Yeah. And then we gonna have to leave it like that. (laughs) Just leave it there. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. (laughs) Go, no, go, go, go. I was going to say, you know, it ties in to a lot, again, a lot of what I speak and teach about, about um, communication with one another and about the importance of breaking our own ego mechanism to respond Mm -hmm. to curiosity and to learn to understand the other people. So I gave a talk a while back and I told them at the beginning, I said, it, okay, so we're going to, I'm going to mention a controversial topic, but don't worry, we're not diving deep into it. I'm just making an example. They go, okay. And so I said, okay, so we have on the one side of you know, we, with uh, how to treat transgender children. I said, we have two schools, mm-hmm. now, right? And on the one side, you have people that are really concerned about medical issues and the child's mental health that way and are we treating them properly and this that and the other maybe you have religious concerns and about half the room starts nodding and i said okay right. and then on the other side you know the, the quote other side is that everybody is worried about suicidality and they're worried about uh you know again proper care and mental health care and and making a person feel loved and included about half the room starts nodding and i said what i hear is all of you care about children all mm-hmm. of you love children and you want to help. And so finding that mission of love, right? Eh? Finding that mission of love and commonality, go from there and have the discussion. Stop bickering okay. and throwing hate and you know and, and fire at each other. And instead focus on that mission of love and come together to find the best solution because when we work together, we're stronger. And so breaking that ego mechanism that we all have inside of our brains, it's there to keep us safe, right? It's there, our brain needs to be correct to be safe. That's how it's designed. And to break that and to learn to respond to curiosity and to learn from other humans, that gives us the ability to put that love and that compassion into action versus just saying it, right? That's our, our chance to actually do it and learn from one another and communicate. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. See, most people, they pray for, let me, God, please give me patience. Uh, he doesn't give you patience. He gives you the opportunity to be patient. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I, I get it. I and get man, it. does he. He gives me lots of opportunities to be patient. Let me tell you that. A lot, a <laughs> lot of opportunities to be patient. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it does teach you. It does. Yeah. Yep, it does. I want to know about your um, neurodiversities. And neurodiversity, yeah. Okay. So what are your neurodiversities? So for anybody listening who does, who is not familiar with the term, that's okay, first of all. So it's a relatively mm-hmm. new term. Um, it was coined in the late 90s by Australian sociologist Judy Singer. And Mm -hmm. she meant it, she meant it more broadly than it's used now, but her message behind it was that different is not a deficit. That message has carried on, but now neurodiversity means a visible and or diagnosable difference in how a person processes information or stimuli. So on the medical side, you might think cerebral palsy, right? That actually Mm -hmm. affects how they process information and stimuli. On the uh, learning and development side, you might think, and social interaction side, you might think autism, uh, Mm. dyslexia, Mm. dyspraxia, ADHD. And then on the mental health side, you might think obsessive compulsive disorder as one, or anxiety, Mm. because those things chemically change your brain and cause you to function differently. And some people have these things chronically. Everybody has anxiety from time to time, but anxiety in terms of a neurodiversity would be somebody who has it constantly. This is a constant yeah. state. And some neurodiversities are temporary. Some are long-term. Some are lifelong. Some are brought on by different circumstances in your life, and some you're born with. So for me, uh, from the time I was around three to four years old, my mother would say she would look at me and go, well, that's unique how she's doing that. 
And as a medical professional, she recognized that it was obsessive compulsive tendency. Oh, okay. uh, even as a very small child. So I was just kind of born that way. Just I was like, look, this is this is the thing. And people will say, well, we're all a little OCD. And I said, no, no, you have things that you like a certain way. I have compulsions, meaning that I wow. cannot not do it or my brain yeah. will actually have a meltdown if I don't do it. And um, so that's kind of the difference. So I started that way. And my parents had the most beautiful response of teaching me to work with myself and to find the, the benefits of those things and to use the benefits of, of this thing. And then to also counteract the disability aspect. Right. Okay. And they did a beautiful job. And I never felt less than or other or like anything was wrong with me to me that's just how it was it wasn't it wasn't a big deal um, hi everyone join the kingdom fanatics community get exclusive content green room access with our guests and more visit our website at whogodsays.com like and follow us on instagram facebook tiktok and make sure to subscribe to our youtube channel we greatly appreciate your love and support to find all information on joining our community, being a guest on the show, donating on our PayPal donation page, and more. Visit us at whogodsays.com. Now back to the show. Uh, fast forward, then the, the next one to pop up. Well, I also at the time had was called misophonia. They didn't, they knew the things that bothered me, they didn't know the name of it. Uh, misophonia means that there are certain sounds that actually make my neurological process malfunction. So wow. um, if multiple sounds go on at once, uh, like clay, or if I'm in a busy restaurant, things like that, it can set it off. Um, swarms of children. So like daycare work was always out for me. I love kids. They're, they're cute and they're great, but swarms of them is a little much for me. Uh, oh, wow. And so wow. I've learned to accommodate that. Um, I now even have special earbuds that I wear that let me hear the conversation, but mute the background nonsense, oh, that kind of thing, okay, and yeah. actually. Um, so I had that growing up. So then the next thing to show up was I had bipolar, uh, bipolar disorder. And I have bipolar one. At the time, it was called manic depression. Um, mm. And when we recognized that they actually, I was too young to technically be diagnosed. They've just put suspected for a few years and then eventually it rolled over to, yes, this is, this is what you have. Mm. Um, and learning to balance that was interesting, especially when you balance it with teenage hormones. That's, that's just no fun. Teenagers or crazy enough as it is and, it's, and then you add this this huge element coming in um and this my parents did the same thing and they set me up with a psychologist that helped me as well to do self-mapping and to really learn myself and after several years uh, quite quite a few years of really practicing um i've now got it down pretty much to a science and i know how to give different outlets how to put different things in place um, I use, I pour my mania into work instead of letting it be destructive. Um, wow. my depressive cycles, I know how to handle it. I can wake up and go, Oh, you think we're, a, you think we're depressed today, body? No, we're not. We're not depressed. Oh, today. And I can actually, I can actually do things to change the chemicals. Now I will still technically have a different, uh, a depressive chemical cycle, but my mentality and my mental health feel relatively good. Not great. Okay. Not great. Okay. but relatively good. And I know how to do things to help balance my chemicals out in a more natural way, which is nice. So I have that. Then I have 5 million health conditions. I, I can't, that would take, that would be the whole show right there. But starting at about 17, I started getting just disability after disability after disability, um, which is common when you have like autoimmune disease and stuff like that, you'll have more than one. Um, and I'm always mm -hmm. a medical marvel because both my parents are. So they're always like, what do you, what's, what's happening in your, in your body? What is this? Um, right. and, and so it's interesting, but yeah, the, the neurodiversity side is especially exciting because it comes with so many benefits and being able to work 90 to nothing. I mean, I had an ex boss that thought it was fascinating and kind of calculated it and figured out that when I'm manic, I do the job of almost three full-time people in wow. about a five to six hour period. So like what it would take them to do a whole, a whole day, like three to, I could do it in only five to six hours and just run through it. Wow. Um, so wow. the is effective, it also makes me more creative. OCD yeah. means that I make sure everything's done meticulously, very detail oriented. That's part of that. Um, so there are benefits to it. It's, there's some definite weirdness. Like 
I've had people think I was on drugs when I'm manic because <laughs> because it looks very similar. It actually releases very similar similar chemicals to to some of the drugs that are out there, um, and and so I I have that. And then with the OCD, you know, that's it it can it can be a lot with the OCD. Wow. Uh, the misophonia is just no fun, but um, but it also gives me a lot of benefits too. So honestly, I wouldn't trade those things. I wouldn't ever. My God. <laughs> Oh my God. It, it's it's uh it, it's good that you kind of pinpoint the positive sides of it because most of the time we hear about any type of disability it's always a negative it's always a shortcoming it's always a restriction or a limitation and when you can pinpoint the things that yes I have this going on but it makes this so much better yeah. it's like I would have never thought to even my one of my favorite TV shows was Monk. And oh, I used yeah. to love Monk. Oh my, my mother God. Too. Oh my God, I love that. I would laugh and laugh. <laughs> but I know, I actually know that he, he's portraying a real person. I would get, I couldn't stop laughing, but I would be like, I would not laugh in his face. <laughs> you know? I don't think you <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you, because if somebody's having a hard time with it, you shouldn't laugh. But sometimes I laugh at myself. I do. I'm just like, what is like, oh, God, like, this is so ridiculous. You know, I'll make I'll make jokes about myself. And even like with my seizure disorder, uh, sometimes I just have like facial tics or like my head's doing like this or I'll, I'll look like I'm mm-hmm. winking. And if I'm winking, I'm like, OK, just, so you know, I'm not trying to pick you up for a date. You're not my type. but I just have a seizure disorder. <laughs> Oh You're my god! Or like if my head's doing this, I'm like, don't worry, that's just my Michael Jackson moves. Don't worry about it. I'm just practicing my, oh my and people crack up. And um, but it it's okay to laugh about it. Like I tell people, like I've had people ask me, how do you feel about shows like Monk? I'm like, I think it's hysterical. It wasn't my favorite show, but it had yeah. nothing to do with his OCD. It's just like something about the rhythm of it just landed with me. But I, I, I yeah. love it. That was one of my favorite. <laughs> to this day, it's Martin Monk and um girlfriends oh yeah those are my three (laughs) those are my three but um I loved it because even though he had all of those ticks like you said and oh my god I it but it made him so meticulous that he was able to do the job better than anyone else and it was like how do we see those things and other people don't see them so when you said that it's like yes like monk like, yeah, that's right. Like, that's what my mom used to tell me because she and my sister would watch that. She goes, look, it's like you. She would send me like little clips. Of, and I would just laugh. I'm like, yes, mother, that's that's me. I'm like monk. Um, but but yeah. it is true. And actually, I the thing that I appreciated the most about that show is that I felt that it did show both the positives and the negatives of, yeah. of OCD. And the problem is people ask me a lot about, you know, the role of media in terms of inclusion and disability and mm-hmm. all this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, so there's shows like Monk that do a pretty good job and, you know, yeah. they do pretty great. There are plenty of like Law and Order episodes that get things wrong. There are plenty of uh, movies that get things appallingly wrong. Yeah. I mean, it just, and it's Hollywood though, so it's kind of like, you know, and what pe- what's interesting though is that people will say things like, I know that's just a movie. I'm like, but do you? Because mm-hmm. I, I've I've done exercises and different speeches where people have tell me that they have a fear response to certain diagnoses, such as a dissociative identity disorder, which is formerly multiple personality disorder. And I'm like, so why are you afraid of them? Well, because they do X, Y, Z. So where did you see that? And it's uh-huh. always in a movie uh-huh. or TV show, right? And so, but it, but the problem is now they're afraid of these people and they're creating a dangerous and discriminatory situation for other people because uh-huh. their brain doesn't know better because our brain only knows what we tell it. So I always tell people, yes. do your research. It is Hollywood. I don't hold that against the movies. Okay. It, it's, they're just trying to create and, and do whatever that's, that's their business. But, um, but we need to do our due diligence and do our research and learn. So I tell people if yeah. you see any medical rep or mental health condition represented in a TV show, book, whatever, spend about 60 to 90 seconds and research the actual thing. And see how it compares yeah. to just give your brain better information. Yeah, and I don't think people realize that there's actual a spectrum. So there, what may be portrayed in a movie could be a whole total opposite end of the spectrum yes. that, or someone that you may see in in real life. So it's like, 
Yeah, do your research. Like I have a nephew that has autism and uh, my sister, she made me watch The Good Doctor. Oh, and I was like, ooh. Which is cute. That's a cute show. I like that. And I fell in love with it. I was like, oh my God. So I, I'm very emotionally invested in the TV shows and the movies that I watch to the point where I, it's like I'm actually there. Oh, I so do that. if someone yeah. told something, oh, we're all talking. We all have a conversation. I'm in, I'm included on this conversation. <laughs> I'm there with you. I got you. <laughs> but that was one of the examples that um, she was like, see, you don't have to have, you know, don't have to be um, very limited when you have autism. A lot of people see stuff about autism and say, oh, well, um, they're not going to be able to talk. They're not going to be able to uh, function for themselves. They're not going to learn how to be out in society. And so when she was like, you watch, watch the good doctor. Cause I was worried at first. I, I was like, you know, well, yeah. not necessarily worried because God is above all, but just to know that there is something a little bit different. It's like, okay, what do I need to do to help him? What do I need to do to contribute? What do I need to do? So it's always been in the back of my mind as I know that there's something I'm going to have to do to um, kind of not necessarily help him along, but to include him. Yeah. That I wouldn't have to do with other kids. And so it wasn't a divide, but it was just that it's there. Like it's, I know it's that true. it's there. It's true. Yeah. yeah. And and that's important. Um, and I think that the main thing that people, when families get these types of diagnoses, need to remember, is like you said, it's a spectrum. So there's everything from, you know, nonverbal and with additional complications, you know, not able to live independently, all the way to people who are high functioning executives, entrepreneurs. Um, right. mentors, mm-hmm. you know, Albert Einstein was on the autism spectrum. Where would we be without, you know, so, <laughs> like, and oh, Dan Aykroyd, the comedian is autistic. Right. So they're funny. They're, you know, perfectly capable. I know people with autism that are good at sales, people who are good at IT, people who are great with art. It, they have just as much diversity as everybody else, yeah. just as much range of interest and capability. Um, but you do have to, just as really with anybody else, you have to approach them the way that they need and want to be approached and teaching them not to mask and to, which is uh, creating unhealthy habits that make them function in unnatural ways. Uh, You know, avoiding that is the main thing and just embracing them as they are. So how do they show affection? How do they communicate? How do they need to to balance their lives and do they need more structure? Maybe Um, these kinds of things. And, um, that's the important thing is in embracing all humans really where they are and and understanding their needs that it's not your way is not the right way your way is not the natural right. way. Your, way, your way is just your way that's it that's as far as you your statement can go <laughs> so you know listening to these other people and embracing them where they're at is so very very important and i like that you said that a lot of people who have been on the autism spectrum have gone to do these great things. Um, my my sister told me one of the teachers, I believe it was the teacher, uh, her son's teacher or counselor, one of them, told her to not focus on his academics, but focus on him being uh, a fun- uh, being a part of society or being able to function for himself. I was like, why would why would they tell you that? Oh, I'm so what is a conversation with that person. <laughs> like, I'm like, well, what, what is, what are the longest conversation? I'm like, is he going to, uh, what picture do they have in their mind? He's going to live in his mom's basement for the rest of his life. And as long as he can put and, himself in and out of the bathtub, we, he's fine. Like, no, it's, that's, it's insane. It's the low expectation. And that's, that's societal disability, which is actually the biggest problem. So there's three different types of disability. There's medical, which is self-explanatory. It's when the medical community, legal, when the law says that you have a disability. And then there is societal. And societal is actually the biggest problem facing disability today. In fact, it's the largest problem facing most marginalized communities. And it's when society inflicts something onto you that has nothing to do with who you are. When somebody else assigns disability to you, in this particular case, assigns disability to you, that's not actually there. And 
a lot of times in my experience, the way that people with autism, just as an example, but this is true of any neurodiversity, the way that they communicate is just fine. It's just different than most people are used to. And even with nonverbal, you know, we don't, we place, we place so much emphasis on words in our society, but there's so many other ways to communicate. So even if someone doesn't particularly enjoy communicating verbally, they can still communicate just fine. A lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times they communicate just fine. And if they don't make eye contact, so what? And if they're extremely blunt, great. Now we'll always know where they stand. There will never He's be extremely problem. blunt. Yep, He's extremely life. blunt. Oh my God. I love it. I, that's one of my favorite things, especially with children with autism. It's hilarious because they did, you know, kids are always blunt anyway, but they just take it to the next level. It's just the next level. So a friend of mine who adopted a young lady with a, a little girl uh, who has autism, she, she went up to him one day and he's, he's older and he's balding. You know, he's not old, but he's older and he's balding. And she goes up to him and she looks at him so serious and she goes, why don't you have a forehead? And he goes, what? And she said, well, your forehead means because you have the, the width of four fingers. That's why it's called that. But you have a four, five, six, seven head. Why do you have a seven head? And she was genuinely curious as to why his head looked different than hers. <laughs> Just, I was like, that is the best thing I have ever heard of. Oh my god! It's so. Oh my god! Funny. It's so funny. Oh my that god. These, these little kids. That, <laughs> but it just continues. It just continues, you know. And oh. um, and you and let me tell you, you can get very interesting adult compliments from from people mm -hmm. with autism. I have gotten some very very specific compliments <laughs> over the years. Um, it is, it's cool, uh, but very good feedback, very articulate feedback. Um, so yeah, just embracing different people, like where they're at, you know, it's, it's okay. Yeah. And, um, and people who think that certain people don't have the full range of emotions just because right. they express them differently. Mm -hmm. Um, I have seen some of the most beautiful acts of love from people with, uh, with diagnoses that are associated with lack of emotion or less emotional yeah. capability. And including the most precious, precious little child coming up with the idea during the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement, because he's in a, in a pretty prejudiced area and is a mixed race mm -hmm. person and yeah. decided to organize his siblings. To, and there's, I don't know how many of them, there's so many of them, uh, to stand out on the road and hold up signs that say we love you um you know uh we're part of you know just different things about love and communication and let's work together yeah. and all this and when people would honk and yell and rude things to them they would yell we love you back and these were wow. little tiny kids with this yes. capability and people are always telling them oh they you know this, this one can't do that, can't express emotions because of this. This one can't. I'm like, that looks pretty emotional to me. <laughs> that emotion. looks pretty, pretty deep to me. So I think we're good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 I was, I was so furious when she told me that, but I'm like, he's already functioning. So why is it, <laughs> why do you think he's going to be limited as an adult? I mean, he's already functioning and he shows emotion. So he has two younger sisters and he helps take care of his sisters. If the baby cries, he tried to pick the baby up. He wants to hold the baby. He tried to play with it with the toys. He helps. Like, yeah. why do you feel like he's not going to be functioning? He likes to fix his own sandwiches. Oh. So I don't get it. Why is his academics Ignorant. not important? Ignorant. Like, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, they, I was so furious. I was like, yeah, yeah. that'd be one of those. It would be really hard. That's one of those, as a friend of mine once said, where you just want to call up Jesus and go, Jesus, I need you to come get this one. Okay, this one didn't work out. Like, I don't, like, I don't know what went wrong, but I need you to come get it. <laughs> Thank you. When, when she told me I had to pick her up, so I thought that they had just told her that. So I was like, let's turn the call around. But she was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> last week that would have been like, oh, okay. like, let's go back I have some things to say 
Turn this car around. Oh, oh, no. I, I think I yeah. would be right there with you. <laughs> like, how dare you? Like, I was, oh, okay. <laughs> well, and here's the thing. Like, you know, you, you think about, and, and from a religious standpoint, right? If I, I don't believe that God makes mistakes with things. Mm. Now, there are some things that happen that are unpleasant. There are some things that... Uh, we cannot explain, but in terms right. of genetic happenings that are broad scope like this, because autism is growing mm -hmm. and now the science is showing that there is a very good chance that this is just the direction that nature is taking us is towards all these different neurodiversities, autism, ADHD, mm -hmm. dyslexia. It's saying these are the things you actually need. Your brain needs these other skills, not, not the ones that we're used to. And so there is a lot of scientific evidence you can look up in like the National Institute of Health, the National Library of Medicine to show that these are being, these traits are being selected by nature actively. And mm -hmm. I just don't think that that's a mistake. I don't think that that's def being defective. I think that the rest of the world, we need to start getting ready because that's going to be more of what's coming. And we mm -hmm. just need to start building that world and getting ready for that so that these people mm -hmm. are more successful. Wow. Okay. So go back and tell that teacher that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna send it. Well, my sister's gonna watch it. I'm like, you need to send this to that teacher or counselor, whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they can feel yeah. free to reach out to me too because I I don't do shame and blame, but I'm always glad to talk to them. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Starting and growing a business while dealing with your finances can be overwhelming and stressful. Emerald Services provides packages tailored to your business needs to help you mitigate taxes, stay compliant, plan for your future, and save money so you can focus on being the creative, influential, visionary that delivers your dreams to the world. Because what you focus on is what will multiply. Schedule your discovery call today to find out ways Emerald Services can benefit your life plan and your business plan. Visit emeraldserve.com or call 504-603-6059. Let's get down to business. <laughs> yes, just, let's just talk about it. If people can't learn. I always tell people, like, people cannot learn if you're doing shame and blame. Even if, even yeah. if somebody deserves it, like even if somebody says something like horribly racist or whatever it is, um, even when they deserve, they won't learn if you just shame them. Yeah. So it's like dealing yep. with a child, right? You have to explain to them things, you know, and then help them work through it, help them make better choices. That's what you do with adults <laughs> too. It's the same exact process. <laughs> what are um What are some of the challenges you face when you got into the workforce? Um, <laughs> I. The biggest struggle I had is not understanding why people wouldn't fix things that were quite clearly broken. When I would be sitting mm -hmm. here telling them, this is broken, this is how you need to fix it, and they just wouldn't do it because they were just stubborn or had ego or whatever. I just, and it's, <laughs> this is prevalent. This happens all the time. I never wow. could understand that. To this day, I don't understand it. I've just learned a little bit better how to cope with that back <laughs> than before. And, um, but yeah, it, it, that was really, difficult for me. And I actually cannot, one trait that I share with people in the autism community is that I cannot stand to do things incorrectly. I just basically can't do it. My brain just won't allow it. And so yeah. I just would do it right, the right way anyway. <laughs> that always frustrated people. And um, so that was, that was hard. Uh, people not being able to keep up with me and getting angry. I actually would have people, even bosses tell me, you need to slow down because other people wow. can't keep up. I said, no, they just need to learn how to keep up. <laughs> so, wow. like, and one time I, I actually told a boss, I said, let me train them because if they start doing it my way, things will all go as fast as, not necessarily as fast as I'm going, but really close. And that boss right. took me up on it and it worked. No, and okay. I was like, see, I could train. Now, some of it's naturally just how I am, especially with my body chemicals. But I said, some of this I can train other people to do. Right. And, and so that worked out, but that, those things were really big struggles because I just work the way that I work and, and I don't, I, those are, there are certain things I won't compromise. I also would never compromise my integrity and that cost yeah. me a few jobs. It did. Um, there, <laughs> there was one in particular, 
Um, and and I, I fully own that this was not the professional thing to do, and I frankly don't care. This one I stand by. Uh, <laughs> there was a time I would gone on vacation, and a new, a new COO had taken over in our company who did not know the industry, didn't know anything about it. And I, we get back, we're going to hold, hold this big town hall with the whole company. And a friend of mine looks at me and goes, don't open your mouth. Don't do it. Don't raise your hand. Don't express an opinion. Just, just write it out. Just write it out. So I get in there, and this guy is up there saying all these things that are just wrong. Just none of them are correct. Doesn't even know the t- correct terminology. And I'm letting all of it go. I'm like, okay, this is annoying, but okay, we're just going to let it go. And he's, you know, saying this, that, and the other about the department and, like, our department and how we're not doing this or that, right, even though he's wrong and everyone knows it. Like, that, that's, it's wow. like, we're not reading the report correctly. This is the actual problem. So anyway, so we're going along, and this guy's just wrong. What got me, though, was then, so there was a young woman in our department whose legal name had been masked. It had been changed in, in the report always when it was shown to people. So that it was the name that she wanted to present, not mm-hmm. her legal name, because she was embarrassed right. by her legal name. Okay. He did not. He re-edited it, put her name back in, and then in front of the entire company made fun of her name. So okay. I raised my hands. <laughs> and the guy next to me just started shaking his head like, oh, no, here we go. <clears throat> Proceeded to tell him everything. He had just said that was wrong, all of it, <clears throat> and then looked at him and said, and what kind of jerk makes fun of somebody's name in front of an entire company? I said, how dare you call yourself a leader? Wow. And just everybody's just flabbergasted. They just, just jaws on floor. And I was fired a week or two later, um, but <laughs> which is understandable. I'm not even mad at him for that part because you can't keep somebody around who talked to you like that. So it's okay. I'm not mad at him for firing me, but I stand by the fact that he was wrong and that that was not yeah. acceptable to call. I didn't even really like that girl. I didn't even really like her, but you just don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you just like, who does that? Who, you yeah. know, why would you ever do that to a human being that's so messed up? So I don't, for the record, advocate taking that approach necessarily, but I don't also regret it. Now, older Catherine, that was like, 20s Catherine, you know, older Catherine would handle it better. I'd still handle it, but I'd handle it better, more professionally. Um, young Catherine just let her rip. Here is all the things that I have to say now to you. Sound like but, me. Yeah, professional you Catherine rip. would handle it differently. <laughs> just like, oh, okay. So that was that was another challenge, yeah, the integrity thing. I, I can't stand like bullying like that. I can't. I won't do things that are unethical. I just, I just yeah. can't stand it. Yeah. Me neither. I've lost clients behind it, but I'm not. Yep. I'm going to lose clients, didn't lose my soul. You can have it all. I'm not that, doing it. That part. So. But I do believe that ultimately it, it makes you stronger and it makes, it makes the business better. I do firmly believe that. Okay. Well, tell us about Titan Management. Yeah. Your baby. My baby, that's now going to be two years old tomorrow, uh, <laughs> with cake. Um, I do think uh, it, it's been it's been an adventure. So originally it started off as tight at staffing, and it was just doing placements and hiring. Okay. And then I started realizing what a need there was on the HR side, especially in these little startups, which is what I specialize with. I specialize in startups and growth stage companies. And so I started pivoting into that and doing more and more on the mm-hmm. HR side. I love it. Now that's actually most of our focus is working on the HR side, uh, designing for universal design, which means it works for everybody. So um, that's kind of my version of inclusion is Mm -hmm. universal design. Like that's that's the thing. We're just going to design so that it works for everybody. Um, Yeah. And I just come in and I work with organizations on those things. I go in and teach. Even if they don't want like full on consulting, I go in and teach and work with people and uh, teach them concepts, teach them how to break their ego mechanism, teach them, you know, how to communicate better, how to um, expand their their different programs and all that. And it's so funny because I have people all the time talk about, oh, I get so much pushback when I give a presentation. I get this. I go, really? Because I don't. I get so many people going. Yay, this sounds so great. You know, or if they have questions, we address them, we talk them out, we figure out solutions that work for them. Um, and so I think it's 
I think what sets me apart and sets my team apart is the ability to communicate in a way that's all about the, the results, that's about yeah. getting to the end result, and it's all about respect for each individual person and where they're at. Because there's a reason that they think the thing that they think. There's a reason that they are the way they are. So we just have to come to an understanding and, and get going. But uh, And I do have a presentation, for the record, that's called Fire the Jerk. I do firmly stand by that stance. Uh, <laughs> just so when you hit that wall and there is nowhere else to go with it, just be gone. Just just get rid of them. Um, but I do. I go in and I work with different organizations and I, I help them learn how to better take care of their people and how to get better productivity with their with their existing team. Um, and it's really it's really a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to do that in my life. And then I go around and I. I speak on those same very topics internationally, and it's fantastic. That's amazing. So how did you find your team? How did you build your team that not only saw past your diversities, but they could also like see your vision and help be a part of that? How did you build that team? Well, honestly, I, and, and most of my team is contract, by the way. So I, I bring in other professionals. And so I actually have... I have really wonderful consultants from all over the country and actually all over, now all over the world because we've expanded uh, internationally now um, that come in and help. And it's about diversity. That's what it is. It's just yeah. who, you know, thinks differently, processes differently, and who just gets the mentality. Because like I said, if you're focused on the mission and if you're focused on universal design and that concept and on respect of one another, the rest just kind of falls into place. We all have our own little ways of doing things and all that. Um, we all meet each other where we're at. I do second chance hiring even, which is when you hire people with criminal backgrounds. I've, I hire people with all different disabilities, all different uh, cultural backgrounds, religious backgrounds, all of that kind yeah. of fun stuff. Um, and that's actually the strength. That is the strength of my team. And I, I hire based off of who the human is and base talents that are just that you either have or you don't, you know, the inherent part of you. Um, some of the roles, I require certain knowledge or skill sets, but there have been people I told them, I said, go out and get this and come back to me. Right. And then, and mm -hmm. then we'll, we'll proceed. And so that's how I do it. And it's, it's entirely based on your capabilities because I don't care about years of experience. You can do something for 10 or 15 years and stink out loud at it. Some people can do something <laughs> for three months and be a freaking genius at it. So I don't, I don't care. I, I care about your right. capabilities and that's it. That's awesome. So did you have that whole, that mindset when you started the business? Was that carried from the beginning to where you are now or did it kind of I, evolve I would, today? I would say that it's evolved and grown, right? It just okay. as just as I've grown as a person, my company has grown as a person. Right. But the, actually that part is pretty similar. I, I was always more focused on talent than anything else. And I've pivoted yeah. places, like, I don't even know how many times until I got to this one. Um, and so I don't judge pivoting. I don't like any of that. I'm just like, what can you do? What's, yeah. what's the thing? And that's it. That's yeah. how we roll. And the first recruiters that I hired had no recruiting experience at all. <laughs> and I taught them how to do it. And we just rolled from there. <laughs> Sometimes it works like that, you know? Sometimes yeah. we have people in spots. We didn't qualify them, but you know what? God qualified them to be there. So a lot of times people don't understand that, but it's not for us to understand. It's for us to walk in what God told us to walk That's in. Right. So I, I applaud you. Thank you. I know that I have always wanted to be a resource for people. Like wherever I connect, I want to be a resource. If that's helping with jobs, housing, um, kids, child care, anything. Like I want to be a resource. So I applaud you for that. I really like that. Thank you. I really like that. So if you could say anything to your younger self about starting your business, what would it be? You're 10 years in now. If you can go back to Litter Cat and say, hey, this, what would it be? I would say start breaking that ego mechanism and responding to curiosity now. I do that now. I've been doing it for a while. Um, I practice in my personal life and my professional life. And I would have started that way sooner. If I had, mm. if I had known how exponentially that mentality and those actions change your life, I would have done it always. 
Yeah. Always. Yeah. 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 That's good. Humble yourself. Break it on down. I like that. That is good. So what do you think? This is our last question before we go. Okay. What do you think is your purpose? I think that my purpose is to make the world more universal and more focused on humanity than we have been for yeah. quite some time. That's it. That is, if I can leave this world and leave it more focused on humanity and doing what is and putting integrity back into the world and putting that focus yeah. on each other, making it more about we than me, then I live my purpose. It's beautiful. That is beautiful. I like that. That's great. Okay, Miss Catherine, can you tell the audience where they can connect with you in any projects or anything that you have coming up that you want to let them know about? Yeah, sure. So I do have two wonderful events that uh, I'm hosting and putting on this year. One is going to be August 24th at Grand Central Station in New York. And that one is called Neuroverse Live, and it is unleashing neurodiversity. So whether you are wow. neurodiverse and just want to come participate, or neurodivergent and just want to come participate with us, whether you have um, whether you have a service and you want to offer it to people in that community, if you want to sponsor uh, one of our sensory stations or anything, we're going to have sensory stations where people can learn more about the day of the life of. We're going to have a history and science booth, a pop up art gallery free accommodations, career and education resources. Um, it's going to be freaking amazing. And we're just going to, and we're just, the kind of the theme is let your neuro freak flag fly. Like no mask, <laughs> nothing. You come as you are, do whatever you're into. And that's the thing. And so that event's going to be August 24th. Um, we're also, and you can go to neuro, neuroverselive.org and check that out. Um, and then I also have Peopleverse coming in uh, October, and that's an HR and leadership uh, and actually design kind of kind of group. We're going to all come together and design the future of work and design what that looks like. And we have people that lead these things, but this is not sitting around and listening to people talk. Everyone is diving in. Everyone is participating, and we're going to get wow. it done. It's going to be awesome. Uh, food is provided, including awesome Texas barbecue. Very excited. And <laughs> the opening of that event is going to be even at the planetarium, which will be super cool. Um, so those two events coming up. Other than that, find me on LinkedIn. I'm all over it. Come message me. It can be personal. It can be professional. Whatever it is, reach out. I'm here for you. Or my speaking site, which is kmccordspeaking.com. Okay. I'll have all of those links for you underneath the description of the video. Ooh, I'm excited. Thank you. So where is the people verse? Where is that one being that held? Be in Dallas. That's my home. Dallas. Yeah, we're going to do that okay. one in Dallas. <laughs> is there a website for that one? Yes, it is peopleverse.org. Okay, I'm going to check that out. I need to get back to Dallas. I want to come back and visit. I love Dallas. Dallas is awesome. And there's a great cake place. I will take you if you come to the event. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to come on a cheat week. <laughs> there you go. Meet me there. I will take you. I will take you to the cake place. We will have a, the best cake in the whole wide world. <laughs> that is crazy. I didn't even say a cheat day. Cheat week. Well, cheat week. So we get the whole week to eat all the cake. A whole, whole week. Because you're going to want to get some to go. Trust me. I do. I go. I eat some there and I get some to go. It goes with me. It's very. <laughs> I've been I have been going to this place for. Oh my god! Like I've been going there for well over twenty years, and I oh am addicted, addicted to them. It is tragic. <laughs> I can't let you get me addicted to. <laughs> Why have me moving to Dallas for cake? <laughs> I can't. Oh, that's hilarious. Why did you move to Dallas for cake? <laughs> Did your job bring you here? Mm, it was the cake. No, it was the cake. <laughs> Were you in the military? No, just got some cake. <laughs> just have some real good cake. Don't worry about it. Just don't, don't 
no question. You know what? <laughs> that's true. Uh, and that's true. You know what? We're going to be signing out. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing your time and your talent and your story with us. I appreciate you so much. I thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today on the Who God Says podcast with your host and Kingdom Ambassador, Ty Chandra. Go to whogodsays.com to join the mailing list for episode premieres, upcoming guests, and more. Send in your questions to be a part of the show at whogodsays at gmail.com. And don't forget, join the Kingdom Fanatic community. Until next time, be blessed and also be a blessing.